a lot of artists in the room. A lot of concerned citizens hoping to understand how access is navigated by professionals in the field. Just like to wait for a few more minutes. Um, we only have 10 people in the room so far. Hi folks, just waiting for some more time. All right, it is 5-5. Five, five. I think we should begin. I'm going to end the poll. So I hope April has been treating you all well. It is my distinct pleasure on behalf of Be Fantastic and the Goethe Institute Mumbai to welcome you all to the first public dialogue of C-Cubed. Um, over the last year of conducting C-Cubed, which for the uninitiated is a program that hopes to incubate open source projects with a focus on communities. Uh, we have realized that the conversation around access is one that is exceptionally fraught in South Asia, as probably in a lot of parts of the global South, owing the unequal opportunity to engage with many technologies. Um, in order to address this, we have invited Vaibhav Chabra and Padmini Remure to talk about their practices and engagements with communities to help us have um, a generalized sense of how this nuance might be navigated. Vaibhav Chabra is a mechanical engineer by training, maker by passion, and an educator by choice. He is the founder of Makers Asylum, a community space focused on fostering innovation through hands-on learning. Thank you for joining us today, Vaibhav. Thank you so much. Really excited to be here. That's great. And Padmini Ray Murray's research-led practice focuses on challenging acts of infrastructural and algorithmic violence and creating alternative digital spaces and imaginations that are characteristic, characterized by feminist values, especially um, an ethics of care. Um, to explore the possibilities of manifesting these spaces, Padmini founded Design Beku, a design and digital collective that aims to dismantle expectations created by market-driven notions of design by following design justice principles that advocate designing with communities and not for. Um, welcome, Padmini. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Padmini. So without further ado, I would like to hand over the spotlight to Vibhav to uh, begin this session. Thank you very much. 
Share my, uh, I'll share my screen. But before that, would you mind if I ask uh, other folks to share about who they are and what they're looking for from this? Would you want to sure. do that? Sure, why not? Would sure. anyone like to take up the stage and share about what brings you here and what are you looking for from this uh, session? We have some folks from our community sitting in. We have Hassan, Dina, Barnamala, Sarvesh. Sorry for putting you on the spot. Um, it's always nice to make it a little bit more interactive than just. <laughs> 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 anyone? Because I can't see anyone. Everyone's cameras are off as well. OK. Fair. I will go ahead and share my screen. So. Today I'll just be talking about uh, a little bit about makers. Hey, Weibo. Oh, hey. Uh, nice. I want to speak with you. Yes. I hope you can see me on screen. I can. Okay, Weibo, special. I want to talk with you. Uh, in my mind, there is one project that I want to execute. You find it is some kind of silly idea that I want to just make a business of selling Gola. Ice Gola, you might eat in your childhood days. Nice. Uh, it is kind of selling that, but in technical manner. I want to make a vending machine. You just listen that one pizza vending machine is settled into Mumbai at some railway station. I don't know about it, but it's settled. Sounds like a great idea. Selling. Let's talk more about that uh, during this. But at the same time, uh, what's your? Uh, where are you talking from? Where are you right now? I'm in Pune. Oh, nice. Very cool. And that sounds like a very exciting thought as well. Nice. Vaipo, one more request with you. Can yeah. we just settle afterward a personal meeting? Because I want to discuss with you more on this topic. Happy to happy to schedule something, yes. Okay, Vaipo, thank you. Nice. Okay. Let's go ahead and share this to just uh, go over time. Little background about Make It This Adam, and then I'll just talk a little bit about the pandemic, what happened. What is the M19 initiative uh, and what went on during uh, the time of COVID when it came to this initiative around open source manufacturing. But before that, let me just give, take you a little bit. So that's, whoops, skipped an extra slide. Let me see if I can go back. Oh, sorry, something's wrong. Oh, there we go. Yeah, so that's uh, Make It Asylum. Make It Asylum started in 2013 as a creative community space for people just like you and I to get together and build stuff. Uh, on the top, you can see our first little garage. So it started in a very, very small little 200 square foot garage to create a space where folks like myself and others could share tools and build projects. Uh, since then, we've come a long way. Our space kept growing in Mumbai. Our community kept growing. Uh, a lot more tools started getting added onto the space. And finally, uh, we somehow made it to this final beautiful home that you can see at the bottom in Goa. And that's where we are right now. So Make It Asylum is now officially based in Goa. Uh, initially, it started as a space for people to come share tools and make their own ideas happen. So just like our friend had an idea for a Gola machine, people had ideas for different, different things. And people would come together and share tools to make those thoughts happen. Uh, we have everything from a woodworking workshop at the space to a metalworking workshop to a digital fabrication lab with laser cutters, a 3D printing lab with, I don't even know, like 15 to 20 3D printers now. Uh, there's an electronics lab with all sorts of electronics and robotics tools, a virtual reality lab for doubling with VR. But however, what also started happening is initially we were a space where people could come and use tools and build things. But over the years, people started coming to us to also learn how to make their ideas happen. And that's when we started building various programs. And those programs started to become more and more exciting because universities from all different parts of the world also started sending their students to us to learn about how to use these digital fabrication tools, how to build stuff frugally, and uh, in a space like Make It Asylum. Now we have two main programs. One is called the SDG School, which happens every year with various universities across the world. 
Uh, it's a credit-based program for a bunch of universities as well. And uh, where folks come up with their ideas and work on the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And then we have Innovation School, which is sort of like a year-long program for 13 years and above to build their portfolios and start to make a journey. And through this, we built a nice, beautiful community in over 30 countries now uh, of many, many folks from various parts of the world that have been part of these programs. Uh, and because of the same, Make of the Salem started to get known as this hub for creativity and innovation over the years in Mumbai and other parts. And many, many organizations started working with us from different parts of the world, whether it be organizations like Airbus to various universities like Monash or IITs and stuff. And startups like Quidditch that works on drone, uh, Physis that works on agritech, prosthetic arm startups, Orangewood Lab that works on robotics arm started coming out of this space very organically. And uh, now we have over 30 of them that have come out of the space. However, when the pandemic came and uh, the lockdown started, all of this had to shut down, just like every other place. And uh, for us, it was like a make or break situation because we were in Mumbai and Mumbai, as you guys know, is super duper expensive as a space. Uh, and we had a gigantic space at this time, almost about 10,000 square feet. So for us to shut down the space was a no-no because uh, it was quite expensive for us. So all of us decided that we're gonna quarantine at Maker's Asylum instead of going back home. And that's what we did. So we started sleeping over there and tried to figure out what we can do at these times. How can we contribute? What can we make? What can we do? Because it made sense to have access to our tools. Uh, yeah. And then the first thing that we came upon was the fact that there was a huge shortage of PPE equipment. You guys might remember that. This is like at the beginning of the lockdown. And that's when we started working, oops, uh, working and designing face shields. And we came up with a very simple design uh, that was easily made using a laser cutter. And we started making them. And we put a big, big, big target on top of our heads of 10,000 of them, 10,000 face shields. At that time, during the lockdown, no shops open, no raw material, just the four of us. We said, we're gonna make this happen. But what happened after that was super crazy. Over 20 people started volunteering and sleeping with us at the asylum and started making face shields. And then we went through over 21 design iterations with feedback from hospitals and doctors on how to make them better for the right purpose using the laser cutter machine. Now, this design is actually also in the Museum of Vienna, but I'll get to that in a bit. Uh, and the other big issue at this time was not just making the face shield, but the fact that the supply chain was completely short. There were no flights running across countries. There were no cabs. There were no buses. Nothing was running at this time. So how do you transport face shields from one place to another? So for us within Mumbai, we were able to use ambulances and police personnel really helped to be able to send them. But that's when the open source community across India came to shine. So we released all the designs on GitHub. We made videos on how to easily make them at your own lab. And slowly, slowly, we encouraged more and more makerspaces and universities and communities to join and start making these. Sorry about that. Start making these locally in their local ecosystems. And very quickly, 42 cities, towns, and villages joined us. Everyone from BBC News to NDTV to all the magazines in the country started talking about this. And we went from one city to all across India, and we managed to make 1 million face shields in a matter of 49 days. Now, a million face shields, just to put that into perspective, it took us 15 days to make the first 100,000 face shields. It took us seven days after that to make the next 100,000 face shields. And then eventually, towards the last couple of days, we were making 100,000 face shields a day. And how was all of this happening? The way this was happening was that 
this first long yellow line that you can see, that was Maker the Salem consistently just making whatever it could. But then other labs, other communities started joining and they started making them. And what's beautiful was that some of them and uh, were faster than us and they were making more face shields at a much, much faster rate using different technologies, using different equipment, using all sorts of stuff. So now information wasn't flowing from Makers Asylum to the rest of the communities. It was a back and forth. We were learning as much as we were sharing and we were all growing together. And that was the beauty and the strength of open source and uh, the entire community that was working towards this. And very quickly, everything, everyone from doctors to police personnel were all wearing the M19 shield at one point. We also got the government tender, by the way, to supply them to all of Maharashtra, which we did for a while, just as a community though. So it was very hard to make the government understand that, but we did at least in the most uh, uh, organic manner. The group that made this happen was completely interdisciplinary. What, what I mean by that is, it was the maker community, people from all sorts of backgrounds, from chefs to artists, to photographers, to filmmakers, to uh, doctors, to child doctors, to students inside colleges. All sorts of folks got involved and were contributing. The youngest member of the M19 collective was only 12 years old. And he made over 344 shields with his family inside his home in Rajkot. This went on to become a case study for various universities, including the University of Cambridge that has recently released a publication on frugal innovation and crisis about the same. Uh, and we also worked on various different use cases of these ideas. We made baby face shields, we made superhero face shields. We made active respirators for doctors at Ames Hospital. We were collaborating with them to build these uh, and design them in an open source manner. We made uh, rebreather masks for senior citizens to be able to breathe comfortably inside their face masks. While this was happening in India, the entire global community across the world was super active, the entire maker community. Uh, open source medical supplies was formed during this time in the United States, and they were monitoring what was happening in the world in the maker culture. And what happened was beautiful. Over 48.3 million units of medical supplies was delivered by the maker community. That is worth somewhere around $271 million. That's a lot if you think about it, because if you think about it, all the makers had the same idea uh, in the maker communities or the open source communities to just get to work, start making, not wait for anyone to start building. However, there was one little issue, the fact of QA and QC. And this was something that we addressed during the second wave and we are still working on. In the second wave, what happened is there was a huge shortage of oxygen concentrators in India, as many of you might have might remember. Uh, and many, many oxygen concentrators were also imported to India at this time. That's when we started an initiative to start building them. We looked at all the different open source design from the Marut design to the Apollo design, and we learned a lot from them. But however, none of them were manufacturing ready. None of them were certified. So a lot of work still had to be done. So that's when uh, we started a project led by Noel to uh, work on building our own oxygen concentrators. And very quickly, we were able to work, uh, prototype over four units and build what we call now the M1902, which has now been uh, passed through pretty much all regulations. And uh, across India, over 30 labs also use the same design to be able to make them and also go into manufacturing with uh, designs based on the M1902. All of the documentation for the same is on GitHub and is completely open source. During, while working on this, we also realized there were quite a few issues related to oxygen concentrators when they were coming to India. Things like humidity, 
breakage due to transportation, uh, electronic failures, all of these were issues because of which a lot of oxygen concentrators that came to India were also breaking down. Uh, those are photographs of some of the other M1902s, by the way, in other labs across India. And uh, okay, I'll get to the repair side a little later, but quickly, uh, this project, the M1902, was also funded this time by Cambridge University. So Cambridge University not only wrote about it, but also got involved and started working with us on QAQC, the same problem that we had with face shields. We started working together to solve that uh, for the open source community so that more and more open source projects can be shared globally, but also follow a certain quality assurance and quality checks. And that's a, a, uh, a bit of research that we're still doing with the management of technology and policy at the University of Cambridge with Professor Mukesh and Jelly, of course. The um, oxygen concentrator, however, this one that you saw in the last slide uh, was, uh, while we're working on this, a lot of doctors started reaching out to us from various hospitals in Goa, uh, asking us to also fix some oxygen concentrators because of the fact that they were breaking due to various reasons, like I was talking about. And that's when we came up with this M19 initiative to uh, repair and reuse some of these oxygen concentrators. We hosted various camps and were able to fix over 30 of them just in Goa alone in a very short period of time. And we continue to do this research and study on how can we create not just an ecosystem of building stuff, but also an ecosystem of repairing existing hardware. Uh, and thanks to uh, Jaga and uh, the Be Fantastic community and the C3, they have also contributed now as a small grant towards this project to continue uh, looking at the repair and reuse ecosystem that we're currently working on. Here are some links you can grab on to later and I can also share them. And that's about it from my side. Thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to uh, take questions later on. Thank you so much, Fiber. Folks, please put your questions in the chat. We will be taking them towards the end of the session. Uh, we now invite Padmini to take the floor. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Reinhardt, for that um, very inspiring work. Uh, so I am going to actually um, talk about the work that we do at Design Deku, which is a collective that I founded in 2018. But I'm going to actually focus more on my concerns about the open access, open source movement. Um, I've worked in technology spaces for many years now. And uh, due to my own experience being a woman, <laughs> um, I have kind of had maybe possibly different experiences of the way that we think about technology and the access that these spaces allow. Uh, and I think those can be further nuanced by factors such as caste, such as class, um, such as privilege. And I think uh, it's important in a country like India to think about these more deeply. So I'm just gonna open with this proposition, which is that entry does not always mean access. Uh, you could flip that and say access does not mean always mean entry, but I think it would more or less uh, mean the same thing, which is that just because something is um, open source or open access doesn't actually mean that it allows for uh, easy entry. And the reasons for that is that there are um, notionally these ideas that um, something like say a makerspace is uh, accessible to everybody and i'm sure that's true but there are of course um structural issues that prevent people from entering those spaces while that also might not even be um accruing to the people who say run such a space it would be largely to do with the kind of uh, experiences that people who are not used to those spaces may have had um, before uh, and the reason why um, I'm opening with this is that something that we at Design Deco have been working on um, quite a lot recently is the idea of a feminist server. Uh, so I'm just going to very quickly explain what a feminist server is or what we mean by a feminist server. A server is obviously kind of the, forms the backbone of all networked communication. Uh, and a feminist server is a server that is guided by feminist principles. And the reason why the kind of 
the notion of the feminist survey even came into being is, as I was just saying, from the experience of women and queer identified uh, peers running um, autonomous infrastructures, there was this there was this kind of definite feeling that there was resistance towards them being entered in this, uh, being entering those spaces, right? So if any of you have worked in any kind of organization that has, say, for example, a sysadmin, uh, that person is almost inevitably male, uh, that person has a lot of power, that person is um, often kind of the one, the, the expert who is kind of, um, you know, kind of always, um, bow down to in a sense. Um, and there is no sense of community around running surveys. And so the kind of the concept of the feminist server kind of emerged from um, kind of feminist and queer communities who wanted to kind of subvert and challenge that kind of uh, very hegemonic kind of way of thinking about the kind of power wielded by these individuals. Um, and so they kind of wanted to put into um, place certain um, uh, principles. So um, extensive documentation, which means that, of course, uh, things would be um, very transparent and easy to understand. I think something that we see a lot, uh, again, in the open source movement is that, for example, everybody puts stuff on GitHub and that's fantastic, but it's not necessary. The, there is still a barrier to entry for some people because even if it's on GitHub doesn't mean that if you don't have expertise, you'll be able to understand what's being shared. Um, so also fostering environments, being able to ask questions without being judged by competitive colleagues uh, and having to work, you know, kind of being able to work without having to deal with the sexist discourse. Uh, I, you know, as I said, I think obviously uh, many of these uh, structural challenges are along the lines of gender, but I would um, argue that in, in our country at least, uh, caste class and economic privilege also uh, are maybe stronger uh, issues in these spaces. Uh, so the notion of the feminist server kind of comes into being in order to build solidarity and participation uh, for diverse identities and to challenge the notion of uh, the dominant boss monoculture. Um, <clears throat> so I just want to very quickly also share an example of what we actually mean. So um, a feminist server, for example, resents hypercapitalist expectations of productivity. So, uh, you know, since all digital activity is running off servers that have to be online all the time, it's obviously responding to a certain notion of capitalist product productivity, right? So, um, and the fact that if there's any kind of interruption, if there's any kind of downtime, that is incredibly, um, you know, counterproductive to profit. So a feminist server is, you know, kind of resent, kind of you know, pushes against that notion that a server always has to be available. Um, and so this particular screenshot uh, here that I've shared, uh, interestingly, is actually taken from. So there is a feminist server called Anarcha Server. Uh, it's actually taken from their website. I, I went to their website and it was actually down uh, for maintainers. And um, the reason why this notion kind of undergirds the idea of the feminist server is that to run a server is a form of labor as well. And to kind of, to kind of challenge the idea that laborers must always be in service of profit, in service of industry. This is a kind of, um, kind of a, I would say, a kind of experimental way to think about how can we challenge that kind of a notion. Uh, a feminist server can also be an act of infrastructure solidarity and necessarily it is always put together by communities. So, um, for example, we run <clears throat> a Wi-Fi mesh in uh, rural uh, Karnataka, which uh, you know, we've kind of installed educated people around the, uh, who live in and around the kind of Wi-Fi mesh area, how to use it, what are they putting on that server, where does that data go? Uh, one thing that I will actually touch upon later is this idea that just because something is uh, networked doesn't mean that it has to be online. I think there's an issue in India when we talk about the digital, there is this inevitability of, about it that, you know, to be digital is to always be networked and to always be, you know, kind of connected to each other. But I would argue that I think that kind of notion of the network is actually uh, somewhat um, precarious and somewhat um, kind of can almost be dangerous. And I'll explain why as I go forward. Um, so I'm just very, very quickly, hopefully you'll be able to see this talk about um, a project that I was working on, 
which was uh, it was a, a game world that talks about the idea of a feminist server and that allowed people to kind of think about it in more simple uh, through more simple conceptual frameworks. So I was comparing the server to a seed bank the, and the way that they work together as metaphors. So obviously, a server is a space where you know kind of its first function is to store data. So if you think about a seed bank as a space where farmers um, and communities um, you know, store their seed for and kind of distribute their seeds, I was kind of trying to use that as a metaphor for people to kind of understand in more simple terms what it means to kind of own your own server. So what we're actually kind of trying to gesture towards is a building of a feminist autonomous infrastructure. I think something that when we talk about open source gets a little lost is that infrastructure building is also part of the open source movement. And I think it's definitely a very uh, challenging thing to do because infrastructures are kind of embedded in communities and which, which requires many other factors to also be taken into account than just the uh, mere presence of the technology or the mere possibility of that technology uh, being uh, possible, right? So uh, there are kind of principles such as consent and intimacy to be taken into account, the situated knowledge and memory of the communities that those servers serve, um, a, you know, kind of connectedness within the community and the idea of kind of autonomous decision making. I will, however, say that these are not completely, un, um, you know, th these are not completely unproblematic ideas and also have issues around them, and I'll just discuss that in um, a second. Uh, so one thing that I was trying to do was to build um, a solar powered uh, server, which um, would, again, allow people to kind of maybe make sense of that metaphor about, you know, seeds and data. Um, and so that this is kind of underway in Delhi at Koch, uh, where we were kind of working with the community to have conversations about what does it mean for a community to own their own civic data? Because as we know, um, India is kind of in thrall currently of the idea of the smart city. And um, a lot of data is being kind of shared in very maximalized ways um, for you know, government and corporations to kind of make use of. And most of the time, uh, people are not aware of how much they're giving up um, in, kind of in service of these uh, kind of initiatives. Uh, I'm just going to quickly skip over this. So as I was saying, uh, if these, you know, these kind of utopian ideas do not come, you know, without their challenges. One uh, challenge which is incredibly um, difficult to overcome is that of governance. So um, while it is wonderful to have things in the hands of communities, one community is not a hegemon. There's not a kind of sorry. It's not a um, homogenous, uh, you know, group of people. It is heterogeneous itself. There are people within the community who have certain uh, demands, needs, as opposed to other people in the community who have certain demands and needs. And to uh, kind of come to consensus is actually something really difficult and something that has to be kind of also embedded in any kind of community activity that um, you know tries to prioritize uh, community ownership of infrastructure. Uh, skilling is also a big challenge, as I said earlier. Uh, it is, it's not easy to learn how to run these um, infrastructures. There is a certain uh, kind of um, expertise, certain kind of um, training, certain kind of um, assumptions that need to be kind of dismantled before a community can embrace something like this. In existing infrastructures, so we have, we often come against, come, um, come against cases where there's an area that has network, but very, very bad electricity, which in India is a, you know, a reality and just makes things very difficult. So just uh, in India, it's very difficult to kind of assume that everything on the ground is working as it should be. And the feasibility of it at all, that, you know, does, does this make sense for the community? Can they uh, make use of this? How, and it's also a luxury to be able to not be connected. It's also a luxury to not, you know, to choose, say, for example, not to have an Aadhaar card, for example, right? So these are all uh, kind of choices that are also governed by privilege. And so, um, having, owning, building your own uh, feminist infrastructure doesn't necessarily come without its challenges. Um, the next proposition I'm going to uh, make is the kind of, I guess, the, the flip side of this, which is that access does not always assure entry. And I'm going to explain by what I mean by this. Um, I used to work for the Wikimedia Foundation. I was a trustee um, for the UK um, uh, kind of branch of the Wikimedia Foundation. And as we all know, Wikipedia is a wonderful thing that has, you know, kind of really helped enhance uh, human knowledge um, and has definitely in many ways become one of the core uh, kind of open source and open access projects that kind of are part of the internet today. However, uh, the editorial body of 
um, Wikipedia is largely male, largely located in the global north, largely white, um, and participation in Wikipedia, therefore, kind of the, num the demographic of editors is incredibly skewed. What this does mean is that the kind of knowledge that is known and shared on Wikipedia is definitely very, very skewed in favor of the global north. Uh, it is very difficult for there to be accuracy in detail around um, you know, anything that is out with that remit. Uh, and something that we noticed is that when you're looking at geographical areas on uh, Wikipedia, it would be only, for example, elite areas that would have Wikipedia entries connected to them. So if we're looking at Delhi, it would be your, um, you know, Latin Zeli pretty much that would be represented. I was working in a community, uh, on a community project in Madhun Bukhara, which is a resettlement colony, which is very far from being, um, you know, an elite uh, space. And uh, obviously, Wikipedia did not have an entry on, on the neighborhood. Uh, and one of the only, like, there, there are only kind of two things that Madhun Bukhara seems to be known for online, one of which is crime and one of which is a girls football team. So what we tried to do was to build, a, you know, have an analog Wikipedia editathon with uh, young women from the community. Um, they, they were aged between 18 and 25. They all were kind of uh, new entrants. Sorry, I'm just going to let that pass. New entrants to the workplace. And therefore, um, you know, they had all bought mobile phones. Some of these phones were refurbished. Some of these phones were secondhand. But they were online. And what we did was we kind of asked them about their neighborhood. So they were talking to us from a very kind of lived experience of being in that neighborhood, highlighting what was important about that neighborhood, what, what it meant to, you know, kind of be situated in that neighborhood. And we eventually kind of came up with a Wikipedia article, which was about, you know, the very core realities of what it means to live there. Now, one of Wikipedia's tenets, of course, is that it has to be a neutral point of view, and that was not disrupted by this exercise. But what it did do was kind of bring to light uh, you know, certain kind of colloquial, um, you know, kind of uh, lived uh, kind of conceptual frameworks for living in that neighborhood. So, for example, there were areas called Samosa Jog and Jalibi Jog. Um, there were kind of all kinds of things that were deemed important by the neighborhood, as opposed to, and this is why I was showing this earlier, say uh, something like Google Maps, the kind of information that it would generate. So, the point that I'm trying to make here is that obviously Google Maps is a uh, is you know it's crowdsourcing it's all, all of its information but what it does do is that it kind of flattens the detail of um, a space such as this because it is not necessarily only built from the ground up kind of drawing on knowledge from people who are um, kind of living locally uh, the last thing that I want to talk very quickly about uh, there's a, it's a pity that there are more people, not more people from the community here because I did notice that there were a lot of archival projects and um, a lot of my work is around the ethics of archives. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of quickly talk about one of the dangers of mass digitization. Again, Google here is one of the principal culprits um, in, you know, kind of under the ages of its Google Cultural Institute. It has digitized um, you know, content from all over the world, especially smaller players who could not afford to, um, you know, kind of invest in, uh, in, in digitization uh, initiatives. Uh, and what this does do is that it means that there is not a very careful kind of understanding of the um, community owned content that is being digitized and being put online. So one thing that I would like to advocate for is that just because we can put archives online does not mean that everybody should have access to those archives. And so I really want to kind of historicize this idea of radical openness. So radical, a, a radically open model is say, something that, like Wikipedia. Uh, radically open works when everybody is at the same kind of threshold of power, but in a world that is fundamentally unequal, it doesn't. Uh, so there are obviously communities who are uh, at danger of their information, of their uh, cultural protocols, of their sacred practices being, um, you know, kind of uh, subsumed by and extracted by, uh, you know, powers that are kind of more powerful than them. And um, in that, in the face of that, does that does mean that access does have to be guarded against these more, um, you know, these powers that can have can wage violence against uh, kind of communities that are less um, likely to be able to protect themselves. So a very kind of uh, grassroots example of this, for example, is a, if a community has uh, groundwater in their um, in the area that they lived in and they've you know farmed for centuries, 
that the knowledge that there might be groundwater there is not something that one necessarily wants to uh, kind of share with uh, you know, large corporations, for example. So I'm just going to end on this note that you know, if you're thinking about archiving, there needs to be an opt-in kind of notion for archiving. It just can't be just because it's possible to archive that you make an archive and you put it online. It has to be collaborative. Um, and I can talk about metadata creation later because I know we're running out of time. Um, but it has to be accessed in such a way, and this is where the serendipitous interfaces come in. It has to be accessed in such a way that people can find their way into the collection in different ways and not through the way that the curator has envisioned it. And the notion of archiving for the community should be something that community takes on rather than you know, people from the outside kind of trying to archive things and uh, making them available to a wider public. So I'll just stop there. Thank you so much, Padmini. That was very useful, I'm sure, to a lot of folks who are in the community right now working with archives. Um, I would like to invite uh, Vaibhav to join Padmini now in a conversation um, to unpack some of these uh, points that were raised. Uh, so over to you. So any questions you have for each other? <laughs> oh, no, that was super inspiring and uh, really uh, important points that Padmani was bringing up. I was actually just researching on some of the work that you've been doing. Really uh, exciting to hear, uh, hear that. And I agree with, uh, uh, agree with you on everything. <laughs> No, I mean, so I have to say, I used to run this thing called Oxygen Bangalore last year during the crisis, and you know, Makers Asylum was a was you know hugely inspirational as well for us. Um, but yeah, for fear that this turns into a mutual admiration <laughs> thing, I I could ask you a question, which is you know something that I did bring up at the beginning, which I think. So this, I kind of really, I'm a big believer, as I said, in the maker movement and what can you. But why? How do you think we can? I guess. Um, I hate the word scale, but scale making because just even you know having a 3D printer is such a limitation, right? And like you know there are obviously only kind of specific cases that can, can afford those. Um, so yeah, so how do you how do you grapple with that? I mean, I know you're doing educational programs. Is there a way through that that you're trying to bridge this gap? Yeah, would love to learn more about that. Thanks. Yeah, I think the question of scale is very very important, and it's uh, it's also about what are you trying to scale as well, right? Uh, I mean. Uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, tinkering labs being installed across the country, which is mm -hmm. one way uh, that access is being scaled. But uh, what's also important is to scale the culture. And like you were talking about from your part point as well, is about how do you also uh, increase the access to that knowledge and interactions to it, right? That needs to be also uh, given. So how, do you, how are you actually inducting more and more people into that space? And I think... Mm -hmm. Conversations like these, platforms like these also definitely help. And I think the fact that we are having more conversations around open source and open hardware and the maker culture more and more these days, that's going to really raise more awareness. The other thing that we were just talking about this morning is that, uh, um, interestingly, I was uh, with certain people uh, in the government space, and they were also asking me the same question. How do you... How can we actually take and make making more glamorous for the next generation in a, in a very simple way? And I think this is what it is. I mean, one of the things that what the maker movement is doing is making, uh, making especially like if you think about it, like nobody wants second generation carpenters don't want to become a carpenter anymore, right? They, they don't want to follow their family's tradition of being into carpentry or welding or anything. They want to do other things, maybe try and get a software job. But there is, uh, but why not? I mean, carpentry is an art of its own and uh, working in that space is also great. So how do you actually uh, glamorize that? How do you talk about it more? How do you make it exciting for people to uh, take their forms of art and uh, also showcase it in a much more global manner, open manner and learn about how it's, uh, uh, that's another thing I think that would definitely scale uh, this culture much more. Sure, no, I think that's such a good point because I mean, 
we work quite a lot in North Karnataka, where say Libri art is, you know, one of the mainstays of um, its cultural exports. And we've seen that a lot of Libri artisans, like the first generation, like sorry, the the current generation is not that interested in carrying it on because they don't see, you know, how it's going to kind of get them a livelihood. But then on the other hand, I don't. I wonder whether it's less glamour and more like awareness raising, right? Like because oh. I think you know there, there's definitely. There are young people who might want to follow, you know, their family kind of um, family's kind of cultural or uh, artistic training, but they might not know that a makerspace might be the place that that happens. And I think one reason for that is that because um, obviously it's kind of also fundamentally entwined with technology. And I think that's where, you know, a bit of a kind of it's, it's a difficult thing for people to conceive that is the bringing together of technology with something that makes. Right, like yeah, there is automatically out. that barrier that yeah. you. Uh, uh, yeah. A lot of people before they come to make a salam as well, they're scared of coming in. They're like, "What am I going to do there? I'm not a techie. Absolutely. I don't understand yeah. this stuff." Yeah. And uh, yeah. Um, yeah, totally, I completely agree. And that's why yeah. we opened up a cafe recently in Goa, <laughs> in the back of Make a Salam, uh, right. so that so many people now just come randomly to Make a Salam and then they explore this beautiful world. That oh wow, a space like that also exists in this country so that's quite in- exciting for a lot of people as well because they understand a cafe but they don't understand a maker space but that's mm. most of us mm. yeah yeah i think it's also i mean and i've written about this somewhere that you know the, the other problem which is like kind of i guess savarna like you know basically dominant caste folk are also not very very uh, interested in making stuff because in a country like india it's the non-dominant caste who has always made for them so there, I think there's also a kind of a, you know, you know, it's, I'm almost kind of, you know, dabbling in something that is beneath me, kind of a psychology. So I think it's interesting that, you know, that there is this move, I think, towards making and towards, but I think there has to be, you know, we need to pull more people in. But I think what would be really interesting and exciting would be to kind of create that conduit, you know, between communities who, you know, have traditionally made like artisans, you know, like, uh, you know, craftspeople, like, you know, even electricians, plumbers, you know, that the oh. informal sector. And I just think they just don't know. I really, I, I think that's the bottom line. But also I think it's lack of resources. Like if we had no maker spaces and they weren't in, like I used to teach at Shrishti and, you know, obviously Shrishti is not a place that, you know, a lot of these people would come into, right? So there needs to be more uh, accessible both in terms of welcoming as well as accessible spaces that have equipment like this, that educate, you know, more like this. So a lot more, I guess, makers, right, so basically, um, but maybe kind of from the ground up also, like, yeah. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I think uh, there needs to be uh, much more welcomeness and at the same time, the fact there needs to be awareness because 10 years back when Makers of Salem began, there were no maker spaces. I mean, yeah, yeah. So if you think about it, uh, for the past decade, we were trying to talk to each and every person. We had to pick and uh, explain to them what the hell is a maker space first. Yeah. And then once they realized it, it took them a while to understand. I mean, it takes a lot of people time to really understand. And now yeah. uh, I think what's happening, what's changed, I think there has been another wave, I feel like. Uh, mm-hmm. in the last year so 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 definitely there was uh, a wave back then about eight nine years back when uh, maker spaces were nothing and then automatically there was this conversation but it was a very foreign concept but however just i think since the past year or less than that even maybe six seven months i've been seeing more and more conversation around maker spaces again picking up which is very mm-hmm. beautiful people in the government are talking makers Mm. People in uh, educational organizations are all looking at setting up maker spaces. Literally, I have calls every day, people wanting to get help on setting up their maker space. And I mean, that's 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 quite exciting and interesting as well that there is this word spreading now where people are interested about this space. They are realizing the benefits of uh, open hardware and open source. And uh, I think... However, it's been a one-way street for most people, but slowly, slowly people are also realizing and a lot of open source content is also being generated from India and going outside. So, which is also very beautiful. Now it's becoming a little bit of a two-way street and interaction, which is quite exciting, I think. Yeah, I think something that we we have found is that one issue, so obviously 
there's so much hype about India being online, right? Like that we are, you know, that there's a lot of digital penetration, you know, so on and yep. so forth. And we really, we do know that that is obviously nuanced, you know, more men have phones than women, all of that. But I think one issue that we find again and again is that we are a mobile first country. So when we came online, we came online on mobile devices. People yep. do not have laptops and desktops. And the kind of work that say a makerspace does, you need a computer. You can't, it's, it's, kind of difficult to do on a phone, right? Like when, yeah. so the project that I was just talking about, the Madanpur Kargo project, when we were speaking, when, so I was sitting with the girls while we were doing it, they all had Android phones. None of them knew what a browser was, right? So because they they are so pushed into this Google ecosystem, so everything that they do is led by search, okay? So the idea of a, of a digital space, like a browser as a digital space is quite foreign to them. And we've seen this again and again. And so what that means is that say even this notion that there's something called GitHub that you can go and like that's really way down the line because their understanding of the digital is so different from ours, yeah. right? That's and I, that's the majority of the country. And I think that is, you know, a big, big problem for us. And one thing that we have tried to do um, in conjunction with this great organization called Janastu is like build kind of, uh, you know, very basic things using files but that have, you know, using Raspberry Pis, but that have very basic interfaces. So, you know, so it mimics what they know, like a play button or a record button, but that's it. I mean, so there's such a breadth of, uh, yeah, just between of different kinds of knowledges around the digital that it's very difficult to kind of think that this will work for everyone without a lot of upskilling, I guess, and yeah, a lot of exposure. I completely agree with you. I mean, there is a big uh, divide over that. Yes. Uh, I think I think I have a lot of questions. Should we should we start answering or yeah? I don't sure. <laughs> Why not? Okay. Uh, okay. So and also, I guess since we're a smaller community of people, I would uh, encourage everybody to unmute, put your video on, and make this a conversation. I think we have the time and space for that. Yeah, that would be nice. Yeah. Um, I think somebody had asked a question, which I will... Anuradha? Yes, Anuradha, yes, yeah, hi. Thank you, thanks so much, Anuradha. Uh, yeah, so serendipitous, serendipitous interfaces is, uh, it's something that I'm very excited about. I'll, ex I'll kind of uh, explain what I mean. So it comes from the work of an Australian academic called Mitchell Whitelaw. Uh, and Whitelaw, basically his argument is uh, about Google, which is that he calls Google a stingy interface, right? So he says that basically it's just this box right that you enter into and it gives you the results now what it does and this is something that i've kind of you know developed that argument is that what you see is this hierarchical listing right and you're only going to be looking maybe at the first few results like nobody goes beyond like page two of a google search or that right now one has to remember that Google is a profit-making corporation and that hierarchy is what is allowing them to make profit, right? So search as we know it is very skewed towards a profit model, right? Now, imagine if you searched for something and it gave you like a networked um, result, right? Like, so you have all the results that you would have maybe with Google, but it's shown to you as a network of like um, nodes and edges so you can see, so there's no hierarchy, right? Like you're seeing almost everything at a go, you're seeing how they're connected and that's a lot more democratic. So in the same way, what the serendipitous interface kind of notion is, is that when we look at a collection or look at an archive, we should be able to arrange and rearrange it by the kind, by different, um, uh, by different categories, right? Like, so I could say, say I'm looking at an archive and I say 1972, I can see by see all the items from 1972. If I want all the pictures that say have women, I can see it all. But so I can change around the way that the um, archive is showing itself to me, rather than what the curator has decided. Which is so I'm currently working, for example, with the British Council, and they have a collection, and it's a very kind of traditional archival protocol-led collection, right? Which means that I have to basically follow what the curator is telling me. So, so what I'm saying is that we, for like more kind of grassroots connections, it makes sense to kind of do it from the ground up rather than, and more, more variety than one narrative that kind of, um, yeah, drives that art. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. <laughs> uh, if you can hear me, I have, I, I mean, I guess it's, sorry. 
yeah, you can hear me. Okay, great. Um, I guess my question is then, uh, like, how do you deal with hierarchies? Because if you have uh, something like you know that shows everything on the same kind of kind of makes the situation flat, right? So how can you deal with that? Um, so I mean, I think the question is like you know what you're seeing, right? Like so, if you're like looking at and then you can think of an example. Okay, so there, there's somebody who created who created the open knowledge map, um, and what he did was like he was looking at academic papers, and he was saying that if I'm looking for an academic paper, it makes more sense for me to see it in kind of uh, in networks rather than in a hierarchy because I I would tend to as a user choose whatever I see first. And that means that whatever is not of interest. So basically the attention economy works in this really perverse way, right? Whatever gets more attention keeps rising up the ranks. Whatever gets less attention keeps going down the ranks, right? There's no effort to push what's going down. And so, if, you know, the richer get richer, the poorer get poorer always, right? So that's what this is challenging, that if everything is on the same plane or you can move them around, then hierarchy is subverted, you know, diffused, you know, what have you. Right, so that's what it's trying to do. Thanks. I guess technology helps us do that, right? Where you break out from hierarchy and get into this. Yeah, world. I mean, this is a design problem. Like to my mind, this is absolutely about design, right? Like, you know, obviously Google is, has been around for a very long time, but they like they triumphed in making the most profit making design possible, right? But, you know, once, yeah, once we can break out of that notion of designing only for profit, then yeah, we can be more adventurous about how we design. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Rituparna, do you want to uh, ask your question? I guess not. But I can see her question. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can answer. That. <laughs> yeah, no. So yes, this is a huge problem. So um, yeah. So during certain recent political moments, uh, I, along with many citizen archivists, were kind of trying to archive material, um, and it's a challenge. It is a challenge. We. Uh, I remember that there was a horrible example of there was a Google Sheet that people were kind of sharing uh, for crisis numbers, etc., and that got hacked. It's um, there is certain kind of obviously hygiene to be maintained around you know owning a Google sheet etc. And I think people have become smarter around that. But the fact remains that it is a very difficult thing to do. And this is where this is where opting in in the building of an archive actually makes sense. But it's not easy to do. So I tried last year. I was doing a project called Riot, where I was asking people to self archive their social media, um, whatever they put out on social media, that was to do with a certain protest or a certain political event. I think people find it really challenging to self-archive and then pulling those all together. Uh, and I think one of the over kind of one of the uh, archival principles that you know we all live by is that people should also be able to opt out at any time, any time. And that also becomes very challenging when we're building archives because it's part of a historical record who has the power to withdraw material. So very recently I was in a conference about archive ethics and the law in India. And it's a field that we're still very new. It's a very new field for us still. And um, somebody at Ashoka University, they're building these national archives where they are, they have the archives of very famous people, right? Like famous political figures. And they said that when a family is giving us the papers, they can choose to not give us certain papers. Now, to my mind, that's really unfair because those papers might tell us very significant things about the history of our country. But because they are in a position of power, they can do that. Now, if I'm looking at more vulnerable communities, they are less empowered to kind of withdraw things, often because they don't even know it is archived somewhere, right? So it's a, it's a challenge, and there is unfortunately there is absolutely no answer. And I think the ethical like, database like, is, a, is a utopia. Like it's something that we are trying really hard to kind of build principles around, um, you know, to kind of think through, even in terms of legislation, because India doesn't really have very strong legislation when it comes to archives. How does, you know, how does one do it? But it's really, yeah, it's really challenging. I think at this point, what one thing that we have, we advocate is peer-to-peer, -peer, 
So if you know someone, then you share information with them and then you share, you know, it goes in a chain rather than a net, in a network because the network is more vulnerable, but it's really tough, like, yeah. Thanks for the next question. I mean, I think you had a question in the chat. Yeah, I think uh, at, at some point we were talking about how open should open be. And I, you've touched on some of those points in the point you just made where vulnerable communities, um, sharing data, kind of making that available access, it can work in under, undesirable ways for people who can't protect themselves, right? So. Uh, you started unpacking it for sure, but I was, I think that's where I was coming from, that the community of C-Cubers have quite a few who are working with, you know, folks in the Sundarbans. Where is, uh, didn't we have Barnamala and Preeta right in the beginning? I guess we lost them, but um, so they're working with folks in the Sundarbans. Jones, I guess you are working with indigenous knowledge, not necessarily communities, but uh, stuff like that, right? Like opening up and saying, yeah, actually open source is a good thing, but at some point there is a limit. Yeah, I mean, I just find it a little worrying. There's, but there's really two sides to this, right? Like one side definitely is, and I'm working on a project that kind of looks at how we can reverse um, the politics of citation. So we know indigenous knowledge, for example, is incredibly valuable when it comes to environmental and conservation uh, causes, uh, because you know we are seeing time and time and time again that their knowledge is what will probably see us through any kind of anthropocene if it comes to pass. Um, but then when I see, when I look at say academic papers around it, it's still academics who are cited, right? And so, you know, there's something here around how how knowledge production is still very embedded in this very Western mode of it has to be published somewhere. That like Wikipedia itself is very guilty of this, that you cannot cite an oral citation on Wikipedia. It has to have been published somewhere on a book, in a book, on a blog, in a newspaper, whatever, but it has to have been published. So if I am talking to, say, somebody in the Sundarbans about honey making, that person's testimony is not knowledge, right? And so this is a very, I think it's a very westernized kind of mode of thinking about knowledge. So I think there's, there's that. The other problem is the idea of informed consent. And we, you know, anybody who works with anybody in a kind of field work situation comes up against this, that I might say to someone that, um, you know, your interview might be used or, you know, so on and so forth. I think people don't know the far reaching implications of saying yes. I think this happens uh, not only for people who are in indigenous communities, I think it happens to us all the time when we sign up for things online, <laughs> okay? Like I think, you know, where that is going, the implications of that being out in the world is something that just people can't even fathom the scope of, I think. So the notion of informed context, the consent, even though an admirable one, is a difficult one because I just don't know, you know, what does that mean? Like, does that mean, okay, I've said yes now, does it mean that I will have the patience and the way we go to go and track it down later if I feel like it's affecting me? Often, if I am doing that, that's because the damage has already been done, <laughs> which is not great, right? So it's a it's a very um, it's a very fraught fraught issue that what does consent actually mean when seeking data of any kind? You be a corporation, you be an interviewer, you be a researcher. I think it's um, yeah, I love the way I'm not giving any answers, but, <laughs> but, but these are things that we are all grappling with. It's not like, you know, I don't think anybody really has a solution. Um, making, making it easier for people to withdraw things, I think is always good, but yeah, short of that, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a difficult thing to, to consider. And as I said, also, no, you, one community member cannot speak for a whole community as well, right? Like, so I might be part of a tribe and I am quite happy to share knowledge. Other people might not be. How do you, how do you square that circle? So there's one, um, there's a one kind of disciplinary area that has emerged called refusal studies, which, in, uh, which is being used quite a lot in um, native Canadian uh, research contexts where communities will work with researchers, but they will hold researchers to this kind of like almost contract that you can do your research, but you cannot publish it. So, yeah, so that's one way around it. 
So whatever research they end up publishing is based on what they're learning, but not citing anything they've learned, which is incredibly tricky, but is something that can be considered. And I guess uh, moving from just that, uh, this idea of um, different modes of knowledge production and knowing and also transferring of knowledge, right? Where yeah. um, communities transfer verbally through bodily experience. And that's where mm. I'm, yeah. I'm, you know, a lot of what you're doing is transferring knowledge by doing, by making, not by kind of rote textbook learning, right? This is it's the other, um, yeah, the embodied experience of knowledge transfer. And uh, yeah, I, I kind of lost my train of thought there, but, but I'm, I think I'm trying to make a connection between these conversations where the indigenous, which is a lot more embodied and hands-on and what you're up to by that maker space where, um, while it is a kind of modern making or a more contemporary style of making, I think it goes back to that thing of saying, let's repair, let's figure this out. Let's use our brains and hands to get going, right? Just the whole, just do it. Get, let's get on and do it kind of vibe, which is very prevalent in the way we do most things or most things have evolved. Uh, so I think I'm just trying to kind of make a connection between these conversations in that sense. I actually have a quick question for for Vaibhav along those lines. So, I mean, so say somebody who is not from a very uh, economically privileged space does, you know, uses something from GitHub, which is open source, and then wants to make a profit, you know, make a profit making venture out of that. How, like, I mean, I know there's things like Creative Commons and stuff, which allows different forms of licensing, but what, 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 first of all, what do you feel about that? Like, do you feel ethically what do you feel about that? Possibly, what were the possibilities? What do you feel about that? So, I mean, uh, most of the stuff, like, for example, when we also uh, open source our projects, uh, we apply for the, uh, I mean, we get the Oshawa certification. So, there are different, different kinds. So, there's the Creative Commons, there is Oshawa. Uh, but what you're doing over there is stating, your purpose and at the same time in the open source license you're also mentioning what do you want in return so i do agree that a lot of people uh don't read those things and don't uh just uh take open source completely like start manufacturing and not uh giving any uh credits or regards back which is which is the truth and honest uh, that's the part of the ecosystem which is going to always exist but at the same time uh which is wrong uh, at the end of the day, what open source is allowing us is create collective intelligence that's growing. Uh, if you think about what patents were doing back in the day, was also doing the same thing, but in a more structured manner. Uh, governments introduce patents to be able to allow more sharing between organizations, because otherwise the organizations were just keeping everything to themselves. Now, if you think about what open source is doing, it's pretty much the same thing. In today's day and, era, uh, day and age, when we have things like the internet, we can create these sort of licenses, which allow us to be able to share, but at the same time, allow us to get credits back so that people can build on top of each other's thoughts and continue to sort of create more and more exciting projects further. And yes, as part of open source, you are in most cases allowed to use it for commercial gains as well. So. For example, the oxygen concentrator project or face shields, it was allowed to, uh, I mean, as part of our license as well, anyone could take that and go ahead and manufacture it. And that's part of most projects. And what do I feel about that? I think I think that's gonna happen even if you get a ban. And that's gonna happen even if you get like uh, whatever you want. Because humans are humans. I mean, humans are happens. humans. <laughs> yeah. We're going to copy, we're going to try and remanufacture. And uh, my professor uh, once told me that, you know, uh, that if this is the only thing, the last thing that you ever, ever make, then go ahead and try and close it as much as you want. Or otherwise, let it out there and open it out to the world and see what happens from it. Because 
there is a way of open source communities also giving back. And I've seen that as well in a beautiful manner. Absolutely. Though yeah. people go ahead, like for example, Arduino. Now anyone can manufacture an Arduino, call it whatever they want and sell it under their name. They're not allowed to use Arduino, the name. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the M1902. They're not allowed to use M1902, the name. That's right. trademark to make as a salon. But okay. however, anyone can take the designs and copy it. Might as well do that. Only thing that they ask for, even Arduino and even make as a salon, ask for that you put some accreditation towards it at the end. Okay. Now, in certain cases that happens, certain cases that does not happen. However, what does happen is that uh, what we've also seen is in an open source learning ecosystem, we're also able to learn and develop things faster, much, much better. So we're also in advantage of the fact that if we're building open source projects, we're able to leverage the community and be able to build things 10 times faster than if we were in a closed ecosystem of a patented ecosystem, let's say, or anything else. So I think it's a give and take over there, mm -hmm. but at the same time, uh, in today's day and age where we're living in the 21st century, it's all about first to the market and it's about the brand value and it's about those things. It's not precisely about just taking exactly what I have and copying that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more than that. That's what I feel. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, yeah. But I mean, talk, sorry. No, 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 but talking about what you were also saying, it's about like uh, from an open source standpoint, like uh, making everything open source also does not make sense. Like I completely agree with that. Right. And okay. not everything needs to be that way. And uh, there is that entire conversation which you're talking about as well that I haven't come across it as much and I'd love to talk to you more about this as well and learn about like how that can be what needs to be figured out over there. Well, where is the where is the gap? Yeah, happy to have it to talk. Yeah. Okay, so Anuradha had a hand up. Uh... Yeah, go ahead. Yes, I did, uh, but um, I can ask my question, but I my, my phone might die any time, uh, any minute now. Um, so my question is for Vibov, and it's related to um, uh, the idea of like maker spaces. Like at least, I mean, I'm I, I'm I'm living in Sweden now, and uh, I, I mean the discourse around maker spaces is like the kind of you know there's a lot of commod commod commoditization and commodification of maker spaces, like with Fab Labs being like replicated everywhere and like the production of the creative class and so on um i was wondering uh if I, are, are you are, are you uh like so do you know about any such discourse existing in india and if there are some kind of measures being taken to like you know make sure that it's still serving the people in the community like in the local spaces i'm terribly sorry i just dropped out in Came back in again there was a internet issue uh i don't know what the question was was it for me or... it was for you I was, um... yeah sorry can you repeat it i know you're low on battery but sorry <laughs> yes um i guess my question was about like the discourse here in the west with maker spaces is kind of like the idea that it's being very like, commodified the uh, production of like uh, kind of you know the reproduction of fab labs everywhere and there's like a kind of this uh, creation of the creative class and so on. Um, and I was wondering if there's such a discourse in India and if, um, if, it, if you know if there's any kind of measures being taken so as to not kind of, you know, do that and instead like kind of, you know, benefit the local community that's uh, where the maker space is being developed. Like, are there any measures uh, or on, on a policy level or anything of that sort? Um. Really sorry, I didn't understand the exact question over there. So I understood that the fact that we have maker spaces in India and in the United States now and the Fab Lab community. But what kind of measures are you talking about in terms of? I mean, in terms of like, I mean, of like you said before, like the idea of the person, like the, the younger generation, not wanting to become carpenters, but like you know, joining a creative class of people, right? Um, in in it's kind of like a myth in a sense that you know that they are not carpenters, they are makers. But uh, but uh, again, like kind of 
Padmini countered that point, saying that maybe it's not about that glorification, but it's actually about uh, appreciating uh, a craft, right? Like carpentry and bringing that back into the local space where that kind of craft exists as part of those communities. So I was wondering if there were any measures or something that's been like, yeah, taken um, by, yeah, if, uh, yeah, if there's any ethical code of conduct within maker spaces or, yeah, that kind of stuff. Um, a very beautiful question. And I think uh, uh, the simplest uh, answer would be no. There is no code of conduct as such at the moment, which is completely, uh, because at the same time, all the maker spaces are very uh, individual at the moment. They're not together, I would say, completely. And that's one thing that, uh, we have also been trying to do is trying to like uh, instead of creating maker spaces that are not talking to each other, they need to talk to each other, and there needs to be more of a collective now between all of them. Uh, and I think that's slowly, slowly forming. A uh, few folks have ideas. There is an international body that's formed that we've been a part of called ICLMI, which is the international co uh, community of. Uh, makers across uh, the world. Now, uh, within India as such, uh, there is no such organization yet, which has formed, but I think there is something that should happen. And uh, in terms of bringing folks from, like you mentioned, appreciating the craft, whether it be carpentry or whether it be pottery or whatever it is. And uh, I think maker spaces haven't, completely penetrated that deep yet. And like we were talking earlier as well, that, that awareness isn't there. Uh, slowly, slowly it's happening though. I mean, uh, every year we try and bring at least, uh, apart from our courses and programs, uh, we, we have an internal target of getting 10,000 people to make an asylum, uh, apart from, not from this community. So that's like an internal target for us that we try and do to expose people to something called a makerspace. Now, these people come from various schools, from government schools, from uh, different communities of uh, different backgrounds. We even try to bring uh, the labor communities and the labor unions to also see a space like this also exist. So we have been trying to do that actively internally that you know at least try and expose people to a space like this. Nothing after that has happened that drastic yet, but I think that's a slow process. Um, in one community, however, we did see something very exciting. We worked a lot with uh, uh, a lot of uh, differently able people in Mumbai back in the day. Uh, so initially they were coming to give us their problems and not do anything. But over, over the years, at least towards the end, I saw a little bit of a shift over there. Some folks started coming back and started teaching other people and asking us whether it's okay for me to bring more people to uh, learn about 3D printing, to do things, uh, to build their own hands and things like that. So I think that was a very beautiful moment for us, but I haven't seen, there are not enough stories like that. There aren't enough carpenters who have come to Makers Asylum to say that, yes, I'm gonna come back again. We've offered them, okay, come, it's okay. We'll give you free membership, whatever you want. Uh, few stories, there was one boy called Ganesh, he was, uh, uh, his father is a carpenter in Mumbai. Uh, he, he was very bad at school, was failing in school constantly. So his family sent him to us back in the day. And his uh, teacher also reached out and we said, sure, why not? Come over. Uh, that guy transformed so much in the past one year. It was crazy. The guy was making YouTube videos about uh, open source projects, opening things up, talking about it. He was not only that, he was teaching international students that were coming to make his asylum how to work with electronics. That also happened. Another few things that he did is that uh, now he's working with a startup actually that came out of make his asylum uh, that's working on uh, flying taxis. So he's making like jetpacks uh, in Mumbai because we moved out of Mumbai, but we didn't want to let him go. So we, uh, so he started interning with them and now he's already working with them and he's not even 18 and the kind of 
things that he's doing is just so beautiful. He's worked on robotic arms. He's worked on uh, different electronic projects just in the past few years of being involved with the makerspace. I wish there were more stories like that, honestly, and there were more uh, uh, breaking of these barriers. And I'm completely with you and want to explore on ways and how to, uh, because what also happens is that a lot of the folks that come from a carpentry mindset, they're thinking about my day is worth my bread and butter that I need to bring home. Now, if I come and just explore and try and do these funky things, they don't have the pleasure of time to be able to do things for themselves. They don't think like that. And that's one big issue with that because their bread and butter needs to be first sorted. I mean, that's the first level of survival, right? At the end of the day, if you look at the mass laws laws and they're not, once they figure that, then only they'll be able to think about what else they can do with their time. And I mean, we can give at Makers Spaces or at least at Makers Asylum, we can give them free access, but I can't pay them to come here and do more, right? Because that's that's like now getting into a different category of different thought, which uh, we're not at the moment obviously there because Makers Spaces are super hard to sustain in our country anyways. Uh, and uh, we all know that they're not funded by the government, they're just surviving of their own. But yes, I hope that there is more such stories and more such relationships that form, but it takes time. Thank you so much. We have five more minutes left, Kamil. Would you like to give the vote of thanks? Padmini, did you have your hands up or something? No, no, okay. <laughs> so I think okay. I have to give, yeah, uh, apologize on behalf of my C-Cube community for a low turnout today, uh, but I can't thank you enough. I will say that we've recorded this conversation and we will ensure that the community listens to it because really there's a lot that you have discussed that is absolutely pertinent for what they're dealing with. It's questions that they're dealing with right now and should be dealing with as they develop their projects as well. So thanks a lot for your time. And um, yeah, stay in touch. I think Vaibhav, I guess you will be staying in touch, but Padmini, we hope to have you come in and uh, you know be part of some more of our reviews. As, as the projects develop, we do have peer reviews and external reviewers who uh, plug in so we will invite you back for that and yeah um thanks so much so much for your time thank you very much it was our pleasure we'll see you soon and we will push this out a little bit more on um, social media as well as kind of encourage the community to access it whenever they have the time to do so yeah all right thank you so much Thanks, Thank much. you so much. Thanks for those who are here and who attended. And for your questions. Thank you. Yeah, and for your questions. Great. So